Kathy here and welcome back to my channel. Today I would like to talk about human good and learn how sadness, loss and sorrow can be transformed into compassion, kindness and hope. Please let me introduce you to Aidan Jordan, an Irish citizen born in Kiltilly, a little village located in Wexford County in the southeast of Ireland. At age 12, Aidan was enrolled in Bunclody Secondary School but continued to play football for his local club in Kiltilly called Duffrey Rovers and developed a keen rivalry with his schoolmates who were playing for Bunclody. Upon graduation, Aidan went to college to become a geography teacher and enjoyed traveling to the United States with Nick, his older brother, and Mary, his girlfriend. Good morning, Aidan, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Kathy. Delighted to be here. Thank you. So um, I have so many questions for you today. First of all, thank you so much for accepting to be with me today. So first, let's start with your childhood. As a preteen, you attended FCJ Convent in Bonclody in Ireland, where you met kids such as Paul, Ray, and so many others. But you played football and hurling against them all. So can you please explain to us a little bit? That sounds really fun. Well, I suppose just to give you a little bit of background there, Cathy, I would have uh, gone to primary school, as we call it, in a rural part of County Wexford called Kiltili National School. Uh, and I'm from originally uh, about a mile from Kiltili Village. So it would have been in secondary school that I would have met the gentleman that you mentioned there, and it would have been through my involvement in GAA, both Gaelic football and hurling, that I would have uh, encountered some of those lads that I went to school with in FCJ uh, and became very friendly with and had some great and some fun times with them. But mind you, when it came to the football or hurling field, all that had to be left on the sideline. And uh, believe you me, some of the encounters between my club and Halfway House Bun Clody they were fairly uh, robust affairs is probably the best way I can put it. <laughs> so tell me more. What's the name of your club? Uh, Duffrey Rovers. Um, and Duffrey Rovers, it's a quite extensive area. It's very much a rural club. It uh, covers the areas of uh, Came, Kiltili and Ballandagan. Uh, and it's called Duffrey Rovers. It comes from the original Irish word Dove Tear, which means the dark land or the black land. And that's mainly because it was heavily forested pretty much all the way from in Escorthy up to the mountains. Uh, and that's where the, the term Dove Tear comes from, dark land. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. So who was better? Who was winning all the time? Well, it has to be somewhat <laughs> diplomatic here, Cathy. You're going you're gonna to absolutely <laughs> hang me if I answer that, as I might. Uh, well, I think, putting it very simply, uh, like I said, all was very, very competitive affairs. I'd say, truth to be told, uh, Bunclody would have had the better of it in my early years when I went, moved into adult football and hurling, particularly, said football. And we came up against Bunclody with little or no success for quite a few years. And I do remember one particular occasion occasion uh, inside in Belfield in Enniscorthy which is the main GA pitch in Enniscorthy against Bunclody and it was quite a battle and uh, we came out the wrong side of it I think but shortly thereafter a lot of our lads I suppose matured a little and from then on I think the Duffrey had the better of it for a few years. <laughs> that sounds really fun and did you stay in touch with the teammates after you left for college? Well, a few you know a few because my family are still out in Kiltili so of course there was a link with, with my home and with my family and with my community and there would have been a few of the lads not them all but a few of the lads that I would have played football and hurling with I would have stayed in touch with it, it sounds really fun do you have any other memories to tell for your old friends who will be listening to you today i'm sure it's going to be so many of your old friends listening to you absolutely kathy and those five years that i spent in secondary school in fcj bunclody they're extremely formative years in a young life uh, a young country chap coming into a secondary school in the town where the boys were in a minority of maybe out of a class of 30, there were probably at most 
four or five boys. So you can appreciate somebody at 12 or 13 years of age moving into their adolescence and being in a situation like that. It, uh, it, it was like, uh, I, it's very hard to describe it. But probably what added to it was uh, the nuns, and there were quite a few nuns on the staff of SCJ at the time. They really weren't used. They had had decades of teaching just girls. And now these strange creatures that they had never <laughs> had experience of before, these boys uh, had appeared in front of them in their classes. So I'm not sure how they really knew how to deal with us. Uh, and I think we really got away with murder. Those were wonderful, wonderful years. And FCJ Bunclody, uh, was, and I'm sure is, and will continue to be a fantastic school with a wonderful educational record uh, and a wonderful ethos in terms of what it does for its students. And I'd have to acknowledge, those years that I spent there certainly had a formative influence on me. And there are people um, that I'm still somewhat in touch with from the staff of FCJ who helped provide me with a wonderful education, even though obviously I was very easily distracted by all the young ladies around me, I did certainly <laughs> knuckle down some, somewhat academically and uh, I did okay and I went on. But there were wonderful years and I have to say I was lucky. I was taught by some wonderful teachers. Some of them have gone on to their eternal rest by now mm -hmm. uh, and many of them have long since retired and I met John O'Neill, John taught me geography while I was in FCJ. He attended our 40th reunion, the students who left FCJ in 1979. We had a great night just reminiscing about some of the people that we knew way back when and some of the things that happened and so on. So FCJ, you know, was, is, and I'm sure will continue to be a fantastic school and I absolutely wish them all the very, very best. You know, Aiden, uh, I have to cut you off here because I have a little story to tell you. We are planning to move to Bonclodi and my son will be entering high school exactly at the same stage as you did. And he's very nervous. So I cannot wait to tell him the story and maybe it's going to ease his fears and all that but coming from a teacher the teacher that you are the fact that you have so many good memories it really does say a lot so that's really good and the second um, little story that I wanted to uh, tell you is you were talking about the nuns I believe that the last nun left so the school has no more nuns it is the end of an era. I'd have to acknowledge it. And I have a wonderful photograph that somebody sent me recently of our principal at the time was Sister Margaret Quirk. Uh -huh. And Sister Margaret, oh, she, she, she was a diminutive lady, but man, she packed a punch. <laughs> <laughs> and we were in mortal fear of ever being sent up to Sister Margaret. And she had a, a little office, uh, but that is one place she didn't particularly want to be called into. Now, I have to be honest, there was at least one occasion when I had reason to be called in there for a little bit of a chat with Sister Margaret. And I'd have to mention as well, Tony O'Loughlin. Tony was the deputy principal in my time in FCJ. He was an excellent teacher. He only passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and Tony was uh, in charge of the discipline for the boys. And at the time, believe it or not, corporal punishment was still allowed. Oh there was a cane. And if we were naughty boys, and we were occasionally naughty boys, uh, we would have gotten a slap on the hand with a cane. <laughs> now, this was 1970. 576 around then and I, you know it was eliminated completely shortly thereafter but you know what I, I don't think it did us any particular harm we knew what we were going to get we, we knew we knew why we were getting it and uh, we didn't hold a grudge we just basically as they say sucked it up and just yeah. got on with things yeah I but I'm glad I have to say speaking speak, Speaking as a teacher now, uh, it certainly was abused in its time yeah. and it was time to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, it was. I had a, I will always remember I had this experience once when my math teacher, I was just not listening. I was all check, check, check all my friends and he got his ring and he made a huge knot around my hair and then he pulled, I <laughs> No, I never forget that experience. It didn't stop me from talking to my friends, but I still remember. <laughs> so that's good. So, so now moving on to your college years, where did you study and what did you major in? 
Well, I majored in history and geography, and Manuel College is mainly a, a seminary for training priests, but believe you me, I wasn't signing up for that. Uh, I left uh, FJ and I went to Manute and I went there uh, with uh, two other people that I, I had gone to school with, Mary, who later became my girlfriend and later became my wife, uh, Martin Doyle. And Martin was attending Manute to, to become trained as a priest. And I majored, in, as you call it, in history and geography and English. Did you want to be a searcher or a teacher? What did you I want suppose, to be? Thinking back, Cassie, in so far as I can recall, I would have been impressed with the idea and the thought of possibly becoming a teacher. But I suppose that was at the back of my mind all the time. And that's how it played out. I ultimately ended up becoming a secondary school teacher. Oh, so did you find a job as a teacher as soon as you got out of college? And, and where was your school? Well, I didn't initially because... Uh, and when I left, it was 1982, and anybody that remembers back that far, it was not a very good time economically for the country. But I have to say, I was, I was lucky. Uh, would you believe I walked on a farm attached to a monastery in Harold's Cross in Dublin, mainly because I was absolutely stone broke, and I had a huge herd of cows, two cows. And while, while I walked there, one of the cows died. So that was not an auspicious start to my farming career. A 50% loss rate in your herd would not be deemed very good. Your life did not start very brightly, did it? <laughs> no, no not, not, not there. But I must say, while I was there, I got a response to an application in Enniscorthy. And I taught there for three months as a substitute. I was teaching geography. I was teaching some history. Uh, but I was just going to add, I got a call back to the school where I had done my teacher training. They had a vacancy. I must have done something right while I was there. <laughs> so <laughs> they called me back. And uh, I suppose I'll have to be honest here. The principal of the school, just recently deceased, Mr. Liam Murphy, uh, a fellow Wexford man, it must be said, so I think that might have been something to do with it. You know, Wexford people tend to look after their own. And as they say, that was the summer of 1984. The rest is history. And I've been a teacher there ever since, right up to the present day. Okay, so you are leading me to my very next question now. Paul, you know, my husband told me that you were on his plane the day he left for America in 1986. So did you intend to permanently move to the U.S. at this stage? Because you said that you've been a teacher since then. So what happened? Did you just go on vacation or did you try your luck in the United States? I have to say, Cathy, you're bringing me back now to 1986. <laughs> and I do so clearly remember that particular day. I think Mary was on one side of me. Uh, Paul was on the other side of me on that plane. Uh, Paul was one nervous young man, as is very, very understandable. Uh, and it was a very different scenario. Now, Paul was striking out to head off to the States. Pretty much he was on his own. And that's funny. Well, I know he wasn't on his own when he got there. Uh, there were people you know, from Bunclody who were there in the States and had been there for quite a few years. You know, Irish people are very good at looking after their own. But Paul was yeah. certainly on his own that day. Uh, and as I sat beside him, as you rightly put it there, Cassie, or you alluded to it, two very different scenarios. As I said, I had gotten a full-time teaching job. Uh, I was just on my summer vacation. And as teachers, we do tend to get pretty decent holidays. And the in-joke is the three best reasons for taking up a job as a teacher, June, July, and August. And it's a and little bit of Christmas time and Easter and all the other vacation in between, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't like to mention all those. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to drift away from you a little bit and talk about your brother, because as we follow with the conversation, he will become prominent in this interview. So you went to the U.S. on the vacation, but also your brother ultimately moved to the United States. So did he do the same thing as you just go on vacation or did he move permanently and find a profession there? Yes, Cathy. Initially, yes. Nick, my oldest brother, would have attended FCJ in the same time that I was there and that Paul was there. And later on, we went to Chicago in 1984. And we went out there, earned some money during the summer holiday time. And we worked in Chicago. And uh, when I think back on it, the things 
that we do when we're young and carefree and almost reckless. I would, <laughs> you can say I wouldn't, stupid, I it's okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah, okay, I'll throw, I'll throw that in as well. Thank you for that, Kathy. <laughs> but you're, ab you're absolutely right. We were green, we were naive, and would you believe the guy that myself and Nick walked for in 1984 actually murdered one of the workers. He murdered him because he was an undocumented worker who could not open a bank account. Therefore, any money he had and any money he had earned, he basically would have had it on his person. And we were exactly the same a year earlier. We couldn't open a bank account. We had all our money with us. And he admitted later he intended to do the exact same to us. Not to murder us, but he certainly intended to rob us. And for the chap from, I think he was from Blackwater, he put up a resistance and it ultimately ended in his murder. It was so tragic for that young man and for his family. But I have to yeah. say, you know, that was just an absolute exception. The vast majority of people that we have ever met in the U.S. have been just wonderful people and so warm and so hospitable and so welcoming. So now, Aiden, I, I'm, we're going to switch to your second life. I would like to call it your other life. So you mentioned that you are a teacher and as if your job of being a teacher was not challenging enough, and I'm sure it is challenging at times, you also branched out into charity work. So I understand that you first brought your students to India and you introduced all these European well-fed children to poverty and human struggles. Can you please tell us more about that? This is unbelievable. I, I can't wait to hear. Absolutely. I always had some little bit of an involvement in charity work relating to schools. And would you believe there's a Buntlody connection to it? There was a gentleman by the name of Peter Jordan. Peter was from Buntlody. He'd be a brother of Tony Jordan's that had a butcher shop there in Buntlody. And Peter was working for Goethe. He was going around fundraising for Goethe. He used to come into my school. He used to look for a little bit of help, a little bit of support, some contributions. And he used to get maybe some of the students to help him out, you know, packing envelopes or something like that. So that goes way, way back. But fast forward a little bit to 2008. A teacher in my school had been in India a year before that and had come back with rave reviews about how wonderful a place it was and how terrible the poverty was. And, the, you know, the idea was floated about bringing a trip from my school to India, particularly to Calcutta. And so in 2008, we brought 12 students on that occasion. We enrolled with the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa is now St. Teresa of Calcutta, her order. And it was far and away the most wonderful experience and the toughest I have ever encountered, both emotionally and physically. And these were now, mm -hmm. the lads with us were 16, 17 years of age at the most, uh, and they were being faced with working in homes and orphanages run by the Sisters of Charity, dealing with children of profound mental and physical handicap. And it really shocked them. And I guess that was the intention. It was to shock us out of our comfort and complacency. And they were just such wonderful lads and they coped with it so well. And it was just an, an amazing experience. And that was 2008. Uh, and I went in again in 2010 with a group in 2012, 14 and 16. And 2016 was the last occasion that we went. A lot of preparation, I'm guessing. It's, um, it's really amazing. So now, I know that Joan, your sister, passed away in the year 2000 and that a school with 350 Ugandan children was named after your sister. Can you please explain to us how it all started? Absolutely, yeah. And when you put it that way, uh, I sometimes lose sight of the fact that there is that school out there in Joan's memory. My only sister, she was one girl with four brothers. Joan passed away, as you say, in the year 2000. And it was Nick's, my oldest brother's idea. And we raised the money for the building of that school. Now, Nick was a teacher. I'm a teacher. Joan was a nurse. But we still felt it was an appropriate thing to have built in Joan's memory and in Joan's honour. But but why did you choose Uganda as the country? Is there is it linked to another organization? How did it all start? Absolutely. As I say, there's always a reason, Cassie, and as you rightly point out, Nick at the time was in touch with and friendly with uh, an organization called Fields of Life. 
and they were uh, ostensibly a charity dealing with schools and the building of schools. And once the school was built, he was impressed by the schools, but not at all impressed by the fact that people were having to drink dirty water from streams and ponds uh, and just did not have a clean source of drinking water. And it was causing all sorts of problems for people in terms of their health. And that's how he ended up moving into the area of water charity rather than anything to do with schools. Yeah, yeah. So now going back to the organization, Nick's organization, Wells of Life, um, would you say it is a success? And how many wells have you built around the region? Well, good question, Cathy. And how do you ever quantify uh, success because you see the terrible need that there is out there and you hope to be able to do something you would like to be able to do more you ask for people's help and support and it's 10 years ago now since nick my oldest brother as i mentioned would have set up the charity mm -hmm. wells of life and to date they have drilled i think the most recent figure i saw was 522 wells and when you consider that each of those wells provides clean drinking water, clean, safe drinking water to in or around a thousand people. You know, that's over half a million people in Uganda are getting oh. clean, safe drinking water because of the existence of Wells of Life, but not just that, but because of the generosity of the people yeah. that Wells of Life have reached out to. Now, Nick did a little bit of arm twisting on me and said, look, would you get involved maybe and help set up a Wells of Life Ireland branch? Mm -hmm. and, and we set it up two years ago. And to date, we have funded 15 wells through Wells of Life Ireland. So that's uh, roughly 15, 16,000 people who are receiving clean, safe drinking water because of the generosity of people here in Ireland who have supported us. So Aidan, can you please tell me more about this organization? So the donors you're saying are people like you and I, basically, who are willing to, to give. But I'm sure you're also working with organizations. Who is drilling this well? So you're working with the locals as well? How does it work? Yeah, just to rewind a little bit, having been a geography teacher for that many years, I would, would have been teaching all about first world versus third world and the poverty of the third world and issues of, you know, hygiene and sanitation and so on, and never had any firsthand experience of it. Well, now is a lot more real for me, and it's a lot more real for my students. But to answer your question, say, more directly there, Wells of Life operates on the basis that we raise awareness, we fundraise, and we contract the work out to the experts who bring in a drilling rig and they drill the well. Well, of course, they do the surveying, they do the hydrology testing, and eventually narrow it down to the best location. And they drill as in, in as central a position as possible for the community. And we stay and we have a program whereby they are educated about the workings of the well, the maintenance of the well, the repair if necessary, even though we do have a program whereby we repair any wells that develop issues. And we have what's called a WASH program, water, sanitation, and hygiene. Because unless you have a knowledge of proper hygiene, proper sanitation, then having access to the clean water really is only a poor first step. And unless you put in place a program dealing with hygiene and sanitation, you don't really have the full package and you're not really getting the full benefit. Mm -hmm. So the way I understand it, you are providing water to the communities, you're helping with jobs because the locals are also working with you and you're educating. This is a full program, but it is just amazing to see how it all started with sorrow and the loss of your sister and a despair and ultimately led to humidity and human good. So this is what we have to remember. Life always comes back. And if you are willing to be good, you, you can do good from your sorrows. So it's, it's unbelievable, Aiden. So now how do people know about you, especially the people you mentioned and people from Ireland? Are you on radio, on the television or anywhere on other podcasts, maybe? How, how far are you going as part of work and outreach? 
Uh, some of us were vaccinated with a gramophone needle and there's no shortage of willingness to talk. And certainly when it comes to the charity that I'm involved with now, like every organization, we rely on the internet. We have a website, www.wellsoflife.ie. We have a Facebook page, same Wells of Life Ireland. Um, the two things I suppose that we most recently have been associated with was a lady, a lovely, lovely lady that I was friendly with here in our community. She was the secretary to the primary school. She was the secretary to the parish priest. She was the secretary to the hall committee and a friend to an awful lot of people. And she passed away uh, a little over a year ago. And we managed to gather together the five and a half thousand euros required to fund a well in her memory and in her honor out in Uganda. And I'm so pleased that we were able to do that. And that came from the generosity of Des, her husband, and the local community, and the parishioners, and the people from the parents in the school and so on. Now that well isn't drilled yet, but it will be. And it'll be lovely to see a plaque dedicated to Maria Keegan on that well. And the other, even more recent one is we are doing everything we can to honor the memory of the late John Hume. And I think everybody in Ireland knows the name John Hume and he passed away just was it two weeks ago or thereabouts. So we are doing our best to raise funds to drill a well, which will be known as the John Hume Peace Well. So if there's anybody out there listening to the podcast who is in any way interested in supporting what we do, you'll find all that information on our website and on our Facebook page there's a link, you'll find a link there that will allow you to support what we're doing. So we're hopeful that in the next few weeks, we will be in a position to announce that there will be a John Hume piece well. And if we know a little bit about our Irish history, um, John Hume is a man so, so very deserving of being honoured in terms of what he did to bring peace to this island. Wow, that's um, that's very honourable. So I will put all the information on the podcast so everyone can uh, either contact you or, or look at the website and uh, educate themselves from this. Thank you. You can look it up on YouTube. You look up Wells of Life, look up Wells of Life Ireland, uh, and you'll see the faces of the children when they receive a well, when the well is pumping water, when the well is being drilled. And, you know, we're all suckers for children will just melt your heart. But in Uganda, uh, you know, and when I look at them, it, it gives me extra inspiration to dig in and do more and try and reach out and try and fundraise a bit more. Because I've seen firsthand and I visited the community and we've had the singing and the cheering and the dancing and the beautiful, beautiful smiles of the people and the children particularly. Uh, and that's, I suppose, what keeps us going. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Aiden, what's next for you? What happens after retirement? Well, good question, Kathy. And believe you me, that's a question that has exercised my mind quite a bit in recent times because I have 35 years of service. I really feel another year or two and I will very likely retire from my teaching position. But that will simply just create a little bit more time and a little bit more space for me to expand my involvement in some of the other things like my community here where I live and obviously my involvement in Wells of Life and some of the other interests and hobbies that I have. So what about going back to playing the Duffrey Rovers once you retire? That would be fun. Well, unless unless I move back to Wexford, as I don't know, did, I, did we point out, I'm living in County Meath, which would be a, a county very much associated with Gaelic football and a little bit of hurling, uh, what I've been involved in since I came here. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you're alluding to our earlier reference to the club that I played football with and uh, the best of luck to them. Um, they are still, as always, endeavouring to do their best in all the different grades, underage and adult, and I'm sure ladies football and uh, so on. So I wish them the best of luck and uh, I still have such fond memories of my time playing football uh, with the Duffy Rovers uh, against Halfway House Bunthody. And th those were wonderful, wonderful, wonderful years. And we did. We had a little bit of success. We won some championships. We defeated Bunthody once or twice, maybe, along the way. So there were great, great times. Really great memories from those times. 
I'm sure the community in Bon Clodi will be super happy to hear from you and, you know, to remember all these times. Thank you so much. So I think that's it for today. And thank you so much, Aiden, for your time. I really appreciate the, your willingness to share your, your thought with us. And again, I'm putting forward the humility and the good heart that is in you. And you, you really are a true example for us all. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I will put all the information and I'm sure if you have time time people from Bon Claudie or anywhere else I'm sure if they want to discuss with you you will be happy to to hear from them so thank you thank you very very much indeed to Kathy for having me on her podcast and to anyone and everyone that uh, might have known me there in Bon Claudie or that remembers me just to say hello and wish everybody well it's uh, I always love getting back down there as I come down carry Duff and see Bon Claudie looming in the distance it's you know it was always my favorite place uh, outside of uh, Kiltili, of course. So the best of luck to everybody in Bontori. That's it for today. If you, just like Aiden, would be interested in participating in one of our future recordings, if you have questions or if you would like to share your adventure with us, please do contact me at bbonclody at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode and Always remember to be kind to each other. Thank you, Aiden, and see you soon in Bon Clodi. Bye. You're very welcome, Cassie. I'm more than delighted to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you.